I'm just going to uh, try and share the slides that we're going to use. So crossing fingers that that works <laughs> properly. So um, thanks, Brian, for having us both at the conference. Um, my name is Rachel Davis, and I work for the Disability Advice and Support Team at De Montfort University. And I'll ask Idalina to introduce herself. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Idalina Rodriguez. I'm one of the senior lecturers in the Speech and Language Therapy team, and I'm also the clinical education lead. So my uh, main focus of my role is supporting students with their clinical learning and their placement learning whilst they're on our program. So what we're hoping to talk about this afternoon is um, to give you some ideas about how we work collaborati collaboratively together as academics and a disability team and look at some of the uh, benefits and advantages to everybody in, in working in a collaborative way. Um, however, I'm just having trouble sharing, um, progressing the slide. There we go. Okay, so to give you a little bit of background then, the institutional uh, context, because that's quite key to this kind of work. So at De Montfort University, we've got a UDL, Universal Design for Learning policy that operates across the institution. Um, and that includes within the student welfare team, as well as um, among academic teams. And as a result of that, we are trying to find uh, more and different ways to engage with learners across the institution. Um, that can be um, so that we can um, enable students who perhaps wouldn't put themselves forward for individual support mm. services to access the, the learning and, and the support that we offer. Um, and it makes sure that as wide a range of students as possible benefit from the student welfare um, support service. In addition to that, we've got a whole organisation approach to student wellbeing at the university, and that's called Healthy DMU. Um, and so as a result of that, student well-being is seen as everyone's business within the university, whether you work in the library, the disability service, you're an academic colleague or in the security team. Uh, we've all got a role to play in terms of enabling student well-being and ensuring that students get the information and support that they need uh, to keep themselves well and healthy. Um, the student welfare team that I'm part of consists of the disability team, a uh, mental health and well-being service and also an international student support team and all of those teams and more within the university contribute to our course specific initiatives program. So that's a program of embedded student welfare support that um, is part of many many uh, undergraduate and postgraduate courses across the university and its general focus is in a very broad sense on student well-being. So over to Idalina. Thank you Rachel. Um, what I really wanted to talk about um, was to tell you a little bit about our speech and language therapy program at DMU and hopefully make it a bit relevant to the context that we're talking about today. So we're a three year program, uh, students complete placement learning. So they go out to settings within our, uh, within the East Midlands to develop their skills in speech and language therapy. And they do that every year across a three year program. The work that we do is approved and regulated by our professional bodies. So by the Healthcare Professions Council who regulate allied health professionals amongst other healthcare professionals across the UK. And we specifically are regulated by the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists. So that's important because the students that we're training, we're training in a way that is core to our principles at the university, but in a, the broader context of being uh, meeting the uh, requirements of those professional bodies. Our students complete placements, as I said, and what they do there is, is kind of do the role, work as a speech and language therapist, but under the support and supervision of, of practice educators. And those practice educators are qualified speech and language therapists. What's really key to note there is, um, as speech and language therapists, and that's my background, uh, I'm a children's pa paediatric speech and language therapist by background. We are, if I do say so myself, skilled in supporting individuals to reach their potential and facilitate strategies that support people given the, the particular needs they have. So our students are working with people who are skilled and trained to 
support others, which is, which is key. Really important to remember that those speech and language therapists are working within a healthcare context or an education context, wherever they may be based. And so they're not specifically employed by us as a, as a university. So all of the work that we do to support our students, um, they work closely with us, but it's important to note they're not employed by us. What I thought might be helpful is to give a little insight, I'm sure many people will know, but to give a little insight into the role of speech and language therapists and the nature of the work, because it does have a real relevance for the students that we're supporting out on placement. One of the key elements in the role of being a speech and language therapist is to be um, flexible and, and knowing that you might need to manage change depending on your client's response. If you're working with a client, you need to be flexible and responsive to them as well as considering what you need in that situation. And there might be limitations um, for some of our students depending on where they're working. So one that springs to mind is if a student of ours is out working in the home of a client, there might be limitations as to the physical space in that person's home or getting um, orientated in a particular way to work with them. A key factor that Rachel and I often discuss as we work together is that our students are working in settings where a situation might need to be adapted to meet the client's need. For example, if we have a student who uh, is going out on placement and one of their roles is observing a, a child to learn a little bit more about their speech, language and communication needs, they might need to be adaptable within that environment to meet the needs, to get what they need to out of that, that session with the child. And that might require what starts as a session where they're sitting on the floor playing with that child, they might need to then follow them out into the playground or into their garden to get, an, uh, to get a real life sense of that child's communication. Might be that we, uh, I know we've talked in the past about a student who um, talked about the length of sessions and we needed to work through with that student that they might need to amend what they do with a, uh, within a session depending on a client because they, might not they the client might fatigue and so the session needs to be shorter or they might not have got what they needed and the session needs to be longer so given our students are what need to be able to work in this flexible way rachel and i often discuss how we can best support them one of the things that is important about um, placements and can often uh, bring up some logistical kind of opportunities, but also challenges, is that our placements, we're based in Leicester and our placements are across the East Midlands uh, region. So covering quite a wide area. For those of you from a bit further afield, we cover areas in Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire, Lincolnshire, uh, etc. And a student might need to travel, have multiple bases across a day within a locality. And so we consider travel that our students uh, need to experience. Lastly, as I said um, at the beginning, we are regulated by professional bodies and our students must demonstrate competencies across their knowledge and skills. And so any str support strategies that we put in place to support a student whilst on placement need to adhere to that guidance. Thanks, Rachel. Next slide. OK. So hopefully by thinking about what the nature of our program, there's a clear context for, for why Rachel and I and our respective teams work so closely together. Our students uh, are, are made up from a diverse population that we're really proud of. And that includes students with a range uh, of needs. And if you can, can see some examples on the screen, a recent final year cohort of, of students, we encourage those students to look at material related to disclosing their health needs or their learning needs to us. And I've put up some examples on the slide. You can see, see a range there in a recent year where students have declared um, information regarding their health, uh, and regarding their learning. Students will or may be known to the disability advice and support team and it's helpful therefore for Rachel and I and our, our teams to join up. We talk to students about making um, reasonable adjustments so 
what whatever the requirements of that particular placement they might be going into so it might be working with adults in a hospital setting for example or children in a school setting we talk to students about given their set of circumstances what can be best done to support them whilst at the same time maintaining that level of, of patient care and I think that's a really key um, key piece of terminology for us in terms of adjustments and, and what can be made that's reasonable and I think it really makes us think about what's reasonable and what can happen in a setting um, for example what can be changed in the environment to support the student but also and it's it's for the benefit of um, those that the student is working with but as I say to students it's also for the, the student's own um, benefit and priority to make sure that they what we do what we can um, and we do what the student requires to give them access to the greatest range of opportunities and outcomes within a placement. It's really important that students feel that they are able to work with us to get the most out of their placement. Given the SALT role, and I talked a little bit about what that might involve and, and, and what might happen in a particular setting, we talked to the students about what is possible and what might not be possible in a particular setting. And sometimes there can be, um, despite our best efforts and intentions, some tension between um, what the student requests or requires, um, the, the necessity to make sure there's the opportunity for them to demonstrate their learning, and the practicalities and the logistics and I've got a couple of examples just to talk through. I had a student not so long ago and Rachel and I uh, discussed who, who requested that given their particular set of circumstances that their placement was not m more than x amount of miles away from the campus and, and their home that was quite close to campus because of the, the traveling that they need to do. The student's learning profile meant that given in order to complete the program, they needed some pediatric experience. And those placements that we had that were pediatric in focus that were local to the campus were community based and therefore involved a lot of travel, would involve a lot of travel in the day for the student. They'd have multiple uh, trips to make in a day. So we talked through with the student kind of what that might mean for them. Another example was a student who spoke to both Rachel and I uh, about attending the possibility of attending placements in the afternoon only as that was was one of her um, the things that that would support her given her health need. That student required uh, a placement working with an adult client group and when we talked to the practice educator the person that would be supporting her the clinician advised that if the student only attended in the afternoon, there might be a limited amount of opportunity as to the, the groups that she would see. And also she would miss the opportunities to interact with nurses, doctors and occupational therapists in the setting. And we resulted in a blended approach where the student attended some mornings and the majority afternoons. And that was something that Rachel and I worked quite closely together to make that outcome happen. Next slide, please, Rachel. So before Rachel goes on to talk a bit more about how we support our students as whole groups and, and cohorts, I just wanted to give an example of how we work with students individually if they've declared a specific area of support that they require and crucially where they've given us consent to share that information with the practice educator, so with the setting that they're going out into placement with. And the key thing here, uh, my kind of key point uh, from, from this slide, is that it's very much a joint plan. It's done jointly with the student. We ask the student if they've made a declaration and told us about, about a particular area that they wish to discuss. It might be a particular health need. We discuss that with them and ask them to give us some information that's not just the diagnosis, but the impact. What does that mean for them and what are the strategies they use to support their learning? And then we draft a letter together with the student to the setting that they're going to work on at uh, work in. Talking about what the student themselves will do, strategies that they know already su to support them, that they may have been supported to arrive at from discussion with teams such as Rachel's and their wider support network. 
and we talk about the things that we'll request from a, a setting and how this will fit in practically. So if, for example, rest breaks are, are a requirement, how will that work in a hospital ward? How might that work in a, in a nursery school? And going forward, we plan to try logistics allowing um, to do this as early as possible in the academic year, she says with a smile, um, in, so that we can work together and give the student the most opportunity to discuss this with their family support but all, and, and friends support, but with also the, the sort of official support networks that are available in the university. So Rachel's going to go on to talk about how we support our students as a, as a whole group. Thanks, Idalia. So up on screen, I've just given you an overview of some work that I uh, did with Idalina and her students in um, 1920. Each academic year, the program that we um, devise and work on together with the students changes somewhat because we try and be responsive to the uh, needs of particular groups at particular times in their course. So in um, Last academic year, 1920, we worked together with year one, year two and year three, but in different ways. And the titles that you can see on screen are uh, the titles of team taught sessions. So Idalia and I uh, develop and deliver these um, learning sessions together with the students and they're usually in a workshop style um, approach. And we try and make as many links um, as we can between the generic uh, skills that we are uh, asking students to develop, so for example, um, presentation skills, and the specific context of the speech and language therapy program. So for example, when we were looking at presentation skills and how to feel confident about giving a presentation, we put that in the context of presenting um, a client's case history within a multidisciplinary team meeting. So Idalina and I work closely together to develop this content and then to team teach it. And as well as uh, delivering workshops which are embedded within the students' timetable, so they're there as part of their normal teaching and learning requirements, they're not on a sort of optional added extra. We've also uh, written some uh, additional material that goes into the placement module handbook for students around wellbeing topics and how students can access um, support for, for disabilities and for their wellbeing more generally whilst they're out on placement. Mm -hmm. So this working closely together means uh, that we learn a lot about what one another does. I've learned an awful lot about the course and, and the needs of the students uh, within Ida Leaders course and we're going to talk a bit more later in the session about the impacts of that. Mm -hmm. But what I would like to do now is give you a little bit of an idea of the kinds of activities that we might offer to students within these workshops. Um, you'll see that they're aimed not necessarily just at students who declare a disability, they're um, activities that are suitable for any student on the programme uh, and people can access them in, in different ways. Um, some sessions will feel more relevant to particular students than others, but uh, generally speaking everybody should be able to get something from each workshop that we run. So I'm going to talk you through an activity that we do as part of our healthy working workshop with first year speech and language therapy students. And this is closely linked into the healthy DMU approach. So that's our whole organisation approach to well-being. And what we try and do um, in that session is encourage the students to interact with all the information and support that's available to them on campus at the university but which they don't necessarily have a good awareness of or um, they don't necessarily know how to find that information. So we use something called the Healthy DMU Hub which is an online portal from which they can access a range of uh, different resources book individual disability appointments, take part in, in um, events and talks and activities and so on from a range of teams at the university. So the URL is up on the screen um, and perhaps Helen, if you would be kind enough uh, to share that URL through the, the chat box, people can um, have a look at that. It's an open website um, to give you an idea of, of what we do. I'm just going to stop sharing my slides for a moment and just give you a, a brief tour of that website.
So hopefully up on screen you can see the front page of the Healthy DMU Hub and this is structured and organised around the five ways to wellbeing which I think probably most people will be familiar of uh, with rather as a model of wellbeing. And scrolling down um, students can access a range of different types of information about various aspects of wellbeing through this portal. They can book onto events, so during um, a normal term time there are lots of face-to-face -face events but they can also book onto online events here. They can get advice about finance and money matters in, including disabled student allowance here. Uh, and these tiles give them access to a range of different uh, categories of support. So I'm just going to choose one. I'm choosing the Be Active tab. And so if students have a look at this information here, there's a range of different uh, services that they can access around physical well-being, taking part in sport and physical activity on campus. So this is a resource that we encourage students across the university to interact with, but the Healthy Working Workshop particularly drives them to have a look at this resource. Any student can access it on their phone through our university app. So uh, we encourage them to get their phones out in the session and access the websites uh, in order to take part in some activities. And I'm going to shop sh stop sharing the website now and just uh, show you the kind of activity we might ask them to do with that information. So up on screen, uh, you can see a couple of case studies which we use with students to ask them to think about well-being. And these were um, co-written by Idalina and I. So we've got Prakash, who's a first year student who uh, has a placement every Wednesday in a residential care home near Melton Mowbray. And for people who aren't familiar with Leicestershire, that's about 20 miles outside of Leicester. It's a rural market town. Uh, the student lives in Leicester in halls, doesn't drive, so they've got to travel to their placement by bus. And this student has spoken to their GP about anxiety, particularly around feeling anxious when they're traveling to unfamiliar places. And he has a lot of worries and concerns about making the journey to placement. And then once he's on his placement, he just comes home at the end of the day, exhausted, lies on his bed, orders a Domino's, and all of this is having a really negative impact on his mental well-being. His motivation is very low. So students might choose to work on the Prakash case study or they might choose to work on the Molly case study. So she's uh, also a first year student who's got some financial difficulties. And as a result, she's like many students working a part time job, taking all the shifts that she can to resolve the financial problem. But as a result, she's having some difficulties around managing her time and balancing work and study and placement. And that balance between um, placement responsibilities and other responsibilities mm -hmm. is a key kind of crunch point for speech and language therapy students. Um, and that's uh, something that they often come and discuss with Idalina and her colleagues. So that's why we've included it in this particular case study. And as a result, she started missing out some placement days and, and some lectures either because she has to work or because she's stressed out or tired. So we present uh, students in a workshop setting with these case studies. We ask them to work with a partner using the Healthy DMU Hub website. And we give them about 15 minutes to come up with um, a fairly detailed plan of advice and suggestions for either Prakash or Molly. So activities that they can take part in, information that might be useful, places that they might go to on campus for support in order to resolve their particular dilemmas. And then when students have completed um, the activity with partners, we ask them to share their advice. And we use um, Mentimeter, which is an online polling tool. I'm, I'm sure lots of you will be familiar with Mentimeter. We use that to gather their responses. And that's important because the feedback from evaluations that we've done with students about our program has revealed to us that they find using Mentimeter a really helpful way of engaging in discussion on the course. And that's partly because it's an anonymous tool. Mm -hmm. So people can put questions and comments up onto Mentimeter and Idalina and I can respond to them within the workshops but the students don't have to identify themselves as being the person who has a, that particular concern or worry. And so it does mean that people are a little uh, freer and able to take part in discussion, even if there's somebody who perhaps doesn't feel comfortable in speaking up within a group setting. Uh, 
So that's been a useful tool for us to engage our students. And that's just one example of the kinds of activities that we do. And hopefully it's given you an idea about how we're linking together our institutional approach, the specific requirements of speech and language therapy students and the knowledge that Idalina and her team have, along with our knowledge about disability and wellbeing issues. So in order to work together in this way, um, we think that there are a number of elements that really need to be in place within the organisation that you're working in. Um, I've written an article um, for the Ahead Journal about this in a bit more detail and, so, and the information about that is, is on the slide if you'd like to take a look at it. But just in brief, it's really important that there's institutional support if you want to take on an embedded approach around wellbeing and disability. And that's because if there isn't institutional support you end up relying on goodwill and people's good nature and that's fine but if uh, people change their job role if they leave or move on or in fact if their workload increases uh, they may no longer have time uh, or resources to to take part in in an embedded approach mm -hmm. so having institutional support is really key it's really important that academic staff see well-being as part of their role um, because it's not necessarily part of a traditional academic role other than it, as a personal tutor. So um, having staff in the academic teams who have got that mindset that well-being is important uh, to them and, and a crucial part of their teaching role is also crucial. Both of us have found that we need to have some time available to work collaboratively. Actually, not as much time as you might imagine, mm -hmm. but we do need to probably have three or four meetings across the academic year where we can get together and plan what we're going to do and uh, work collaboratively to devise material and approaches. And the disability uh, team need to have a role a part of as part of their role facilitating this embedded working because like academic colleagues otherwise when our role uh, when our responsibilities increase this is the kind of work that it's easy to put to one side so those elements we think need to be in place in order for this to be a successful approach so i'm going to hand over to idolina now for the remainder of the presentation to talk a little bit about um, her perspective on how things have worked Thank you. Um, I think there are, as Rachel began to talk about this, th there's um, lots in place already for us uh, in order to work together. And there are some real clear benefits for us in to work, work together and to work in this way. Um, I certainly have a much better understanding of, of Rachel's role. So on a personal note, knowing what as a member of staff, uh, is available to me uh, as an academic member of staff in order to best support my students. I know that I have got support for, from, from Rachel and her team. As you can imagine, and as everybody is experiencing at this time of huge change, um, especially, there, the university is constantly working to uh, make sure the facilities and the things that are available. So uh, that healthy DMU website is being updated, things are being added given the current context. Actually, it's really helpful to be able to identify things early and be able to signpost those to our students. And I know that working with Rachel will give me the most uh, up-to-date knowledge that I can share with my students. From, for us, as a, specifically as a, as, a, as a SLT program, as a program that is regulated by the Healthcare and Professions Council, by the HCPC, engaging students very early on in their well-being, healthy well-being, um, and seeing their role, seeing it as part of their role that they've got a, re a responsibility to maintain their fitness to practice, engaging them in that process um, of, t of looking after um, their ability to do the role, getting them to think about that as a student, sows the seeds for them going on to do that throughout their career. So from a continuing professional development perspective, we're happy to start them early, think, getting engaged in, in thinking about their responsibility to be fit to practice. One of the things that we want to do a lot more of is collecting the feedback from um, the, the placement settings that the students uh, are going into as well as the students themselves and colleagues and 
we've we've made changes and tweaks as you do along the way to the way we do things um, and so gathering feedback about the students perspective and the, the practice educators perspective will be really helpful in developing the way we continue to work in future our professional body requirements are key to, to all that we do and it's really helpful to work with a team who can work closely with students to talk about how they their how the support from the university can help them whilst they're on placement even though they're not on campus they they still have that support available to them and fundamentally to us as a as a health as as training allied health professionals all of this really correlates within to the role of a speech and language therapist and there's an, a slide next slide please Rachel that to me um, is, a, is, a, is, is a really satisfying way of thinking, well, actually what we're doing in our academic work while we're on campus really feeds into the SLTs of the future. So just as a few examples, work around healthy working and, and time management, there are all, those are all professional skills that an SLT is going to need in their, in their career encouraging students to think about what are the challenges what are the opportunities and how we can overcome them as we did in the example that, that Rachel showed with those case studies that's a key part being able to identify your areas of strength and your areas of development are a key part of continuing professional development so our you know our students leave as qualified SLTs but they go on to develop in their career and we're embedding those those skills Rachel talked about the presenting information um, and being able to present a client's um, profile, their, their clinical profile is a fundamental skill and so helpful that we've given them the, the, the building blocks there. And I think crucially that the work that we do with our final year students really is that, that bridge into being an autonomous clinician. And those skills around managing time and workload are those that they will continue to use on into their career. Thank you. Uh, so that brings our presentation part of our of our um, session to an end. So I'm going to stop sharing the slides and um, at this point, uh, head over to Helen for any questions. Yes. Yeah, so firstly, just to say thank you both, Rachel and Idalina. That was really um, brilliant as a presentation. A lot of um, food for thought there, certainly.